Hello everyone and good evening. Welcome to our 37th Keta Hamburger lecture with Dr. Jonathan Lusthaus, who will speak about inside the business of cybercrime, trust and cooperation among cyber criminals. My name is Frank Gardinger and I'm one of the research group leaders at the Center for Global Cooperation Research and I moderate our event, which will take place again in the virtual format. I'm very happy that Jonathan accepted our invitation as he's working on an interesting and rather underexplored research question around the agenda of global cooperation. How do cyber criminals cooperate with each other and how do they overcome the problem of trust and are able to build a shadow industry on a grand scale? Such a research perspective is highly innovative as it contributes to a mostly ignored issue in global cooperation research. The dark sides of cooperation, as we call it at the center. From the perspective of global cooperation research, a typical pathway is to think about cooperation in normatively desired ways. For example, to look at the negotiations on climate change. In contrast to undesired forms of cooperation, let's say the way how right-wing networks cooperate with, with each other. At the center, we had the chance to learn from fellows who worked on similar undesired forms of cooperation, for example, on the case of legal practices around tax avoidance. But to be honest, until now, it has not been a major topic in our research agenda. We aim to do more research in this direction. Let me now take the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Lusthaus, as well as our discussant, Carolina Aguer. Jonathan Lusthaus is director of the Human Cyber Criminal Project at the Department of Sociology and the research associate at the Center for Technology and Global Affairs at the University of Oxford. Jonathan research focus on the human side of pro profit-driven cybercrime, who cyber criminals are and how they are organized. He is a regular speaker at conferences as his expertise is quite rare to get. And he has written widely across academic policy and media publications. He recently completed a seven year global study on the organization of cybercrime published by Harvard University Press as Industry of Anonymity Inside the Business of Cybercrime. The book is highly recommended as it is deeply grounded in empirical work. His analysis is based on almost 250 interviews in 20 countries all over the world. So you can ask him later after the official talk how he did that. Our current senior research fellow, Carolina Aguer, will be the discussant after Jonathan's talk. In her research at the center, Carolina focused on a project around internet governance and data issues, future path of cooperation mechanisms. She's also a lecturer and associate professor at the University of San Andres in Buenos Aires in the Department of Social Science. Carolina is currently also serving on the steering committee of the Global Academic Internet Governance Network. Her main research interests include polycentricity in internet policy and governance, particularly on issues related to the DNS, national and regional mechanisms and the regional digital economy. Thank you very much to both of you to participate in, the, in this public event and to bring us to fresh ideas on issues of cooperation, which certainly play a role in the discursive struggle after the results of the US elections, I will assume. Concerning the practical issues, Jonathan will talk for about 25 minutes, then Carolina will comment around seven to 10 minutes, and then we have 20 minutes left for open discussion. So you can write um, your questions in the public chat and then I will read them and Jonathan will reply to them. So thank you very much and Jonathan, go forward. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me speak. I'll just uh, get the slides up and running. It's a, a real pleasure to be speaking to you uh, from the UK. Originally, uh, this talk was planned that I'd be there in person uh, many, many months ago. Obviously, certain uh, events have intervened, and now this is an online talk, but it's still a, a real pleasure to be speaking to 
a community that's very interested in cooperation because often the audiences I speak to, their primary interest is cybercrime and I have to spend a lot of time explaining the kind of cooperation side of things to them. So it's, it's very nice to have the reverse and I'll, I'll maybe spend a little bit of time talking about the cybercrime part and, and make sure that that aspect is understood. And maybe I, I think there might be some very important things around cooperation that I could learn from this audience. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to that. Before I get into the details of the presentation, uh, what I like to do is, is begin with uh, some images of some real life cyber criminals, because I think it's very important to set the scene in terms of what we're talking about, that this is a human issue, because people often see cybercrime as a very technical subject. Um, you know, they talk about big threats, they talk about hacking, they talk about malware, they talk about all these sorts of things that really remove attention away from the people carrying out cybercrime. And actually, as a sociologist, what I'm interested in is those people who they are, how they're organized, and in this case, how they trust each other, how they work together and how they cooperate. So here I'm showing you two images of, I think, some of the most important cyber criminals in the history of cyber crime. So on the left is Dmitry Golubov, his name was Script online. On the right is Roman Vega, his online name was Boa. And why these two individuals are very important is that they were key members of a website called Carter Planet. And we talk a lot nowadays in the media and other places about the dark web or about the dark net, which sounds very scary and very intimidating. Um, but really what we're talking about in this case is two decades ago almost, uh, they created a, a very similar website. They created a marketplace uh, very much like eBay, but one in which the products and the services were criminal. So in their case, credit card fraud was, was a major part of this uh, business. They were really trading compromised credit card data and then people were buying that and using it to do transactions in, in various ways. There are a whole number of other products that have emerged since then uh, in terms of compromised e-commerce accounts, in terms of buying technical products like malware and, and hiring people to hack things and all sorts of things. But this in a sense was the origin. Uh, it wasn't the first marketplace of all time, but it was the one that really took off uh, it was one that became a model for how marketplaces in the future work for cyber criminals as a place that they could come together, they could congregate, they could network, and they could trade. And so this is a really, really important case. And we're talking around 2001 when this was, was going on, so quite a long time ago now. But why I also like to talk about this case and, and bring up these two faces of two individuals here is to think about not just the people involved, but also the context that they come from and some of the kind of stories and backgrounds that they have. So both these two gentlemen are Ukrainian. Um, their kind of origin point, if there is such a thing, of this particular website, Carter Planet, was Odessa. This was the hometown of Script, Dmitry, Dmitry Golubov. And so if you look at the two sort of histories of these two gentlemen, they, they have quite divergent narratives after they were involved in this particular activity. So Boa, Roman Vega on the right, he was arrested in Cyprus and he was extradited to the US and he was given a very, very long prison term. And he really, you know, we're talking decades almost. Uh, Golubov, on the other hand, was arrested in Odessa. So he was arrested in his hometown. He was released after a six month period on the advice of two local politicians. And he ended up going into politics himself. And so this is where it gets quite interesting because he founded the Internet Party of Ukraine. Um, they used to do certain things around internet policy, but they'd also do kind of quite sort of jokes and pranks around, uh, you know, running candidates like Darth Vader and elections and things like this. But ultimately Golubov was actually elected to parliament. Uh, and he became actually a member of the Petro Poroshenko bloc, which up until the most recent elections was the ruling party in Ukraine. So what this tells us is the people involved in this are actually quite serious individuals. He was very young when he was involved in the cybercrime aspect, but he was a very effective organizer, a very effective manager. And the sorts of individuals involved with this are, are talented. They're capable, talented people. This is not a joke. And it's something we should take very seriously, both in terms of what they're able to do technically, but also how well they're able to manage their affairs how, and how well they're able to cooperate, which is ultimately what I'm speaking to you about today. So in terms of, uh, a very, very quick tour of how cybercrime has evolved, just to give you this background before we get onto the cooperation angles. Uh, basically, what we're looking at here is, is a, a shorter history than people think. I, I think people often tie hacking and cybercrime together. But if we're interested in profit-driven cybercrime, which is what I'm talking to you about today, actually, the histories are quite different. So computer hacking starts in about the 1950s. That's when we start to get computers. And really, these are large mainframes. And usually within universities and government type of uh, complexes, not very widely used or, or available. This is uh, you know, something, an activity that can really be used for positive or negative. Um, it, there's no good or bad hacking in, in a pure sense. We, we, it's just a skill. It, it's, it's something that you can depending on your motivation, employ for your, for your purposes. So when we start to talk about cybercrime, 
and particularly profit-driven cybercrime, the real point at which that emerges is actually the 1990s. And that's because that's the point that we start to put things of value online. So putting data online, we start to doing transactions online. And before that, there's not really an opportunity to make money in a large way. So that's the point at which the targets become more available and therefore there's profit to be made in terms of cybercrime. We start to see individuals doing this, but it's not a very organized activity. The real organization starts to take place in the 2000s. So the Carter Planet case is, is symbolic of this. It's not the only example of how this occurred and it's not the only kind of pathway in terms of how cooperation developed. But it was at this point that you really see, in my view, a shift towards industrialization. You see a shift towards people cooperating on a much larger scale, a really high degree of specialization. And that's what we're seeing today is a very, very clear division of labor, that there are certain people responsible for very technical components of, of cybercrime. There's others who might be involved in, say, the money side of things and not really have any type of technical skill whatsoever. Some others are entrepreneurs and managers. Uh, and it's, only, it's also highly professional. So we're seeing uh, really people involved, as I mentioned, who are very capable, sometimes highly educated. Sometimes they have a, a university degree or even multiple degrees. So that's really a, a key kind of component of this is understanding really the skill and the ability of those involved in, in this activity. So to get onto the cooperation part, really the puzzle that fascinated with me, uh, that fascinated me with this, with this research and how I got really, really deep into it was I was very interested in how cyber criminals work together when we'd expect that they wouldn't be able to. And the reason for this is, is ultimately that if we think about how, who cyber criminals are, we, we think about people who are criminals, which on, on the face of it, don't make the most trustworthy partners. These are people who, who are ripping people off for a living. Why would you work with such a person? Uh, but on top of that, we're talking about criminals trying to work with other criminals in an online environment where they don't necessarily know the true identity of the people they're working with, that if things go badly, they can't turn up to their house and beat them up because they don't know who they are and they don't know where they live. So this creates a massive trust and cooperation problem. And so in terms of trying to understand how they solve this problem, that's the puzzle that, that I got very fascinated with, is what are the mechanisms that they've developed to overcome this problem? Because we'd expect them to operate in small groups or, or alone, but what we're seeing is larger groups and really a kind of industry form. So that's the core of what I tried to investigate here in this study. So as was mentioned in the introduction, I spent really a very long time doing this. Uh, it became an obsession in my life over a seven year period in terms of the data collection and even longer in terms of the, the writing of the book and, and those elements as well. So I interviewed 238 people. Uh, these were from a range of backgrounds. They're from law enforcement backgrounds. They're from the private sector. So people involved in the investigation or intelligence around cybercrime, of which there's many within the private sector tracking this stuff closely alongside law enforcement. But then also trying to incorporate the views of former cyber criminals. So trying to get the information directly from people who carried out cyber crime in the past to get that really more nuanced perspective. And so that was very important to me. And that really took me quite a lot of time to, to get to some individuals like that. And I did this, as was mentioned in the introduction, in, in a large range of countries. So part of this was to get a spread to see how cybercrime differed in different locations. But it was also to make sure that I visit, visited some of the key hotspots where cybercrime uh, is known to be a major threat. So these are places like uh, Ukraine, like Russia, Romania, Nigeria, China, Brazil, and a number of others that had been, I'd been alerted to by people that I'd interviewed saying, well, these are locations you should really look at in terms of trying to understand where some of the, the major cyber criminal threat is coming from. And so that's, that's what I did. So to get on to the, the solving of this puzzle, which is trying to understand how these cyber criminals cooperate successfully together when the odds seem to be against them, when there seem to be a number of challenges facing them. And so this is a part, I think, speaking to an audience interested in cooperation, uh, I'll do the opposite of what I usually have to do, which is uh, provide a lesson on cooperation to, to people from the cybercrime and cybersecurity community. So in those instances, what often happens is they try and reinvent the wheel. They try and think, well, there, there's a problem here. It's a cybersecurity problem or a cybercrime problem. Let's try and figure it out. But what I actually did in this study was go back to existing literature, particularly in the social sciences, around how cooperation works and try to actually see how well that mapped onto the case that I was looking at rather than coming up with any new theory or, or anything like this. So to me, the natural starting point of how these people work together was trust, was trying to understand whether this was, was a potential explanation. And what I soon discovered there was actually trust wasn't necessarily the best word or the best term that, that I could employ because what it seemed to me from the literature and I take Coleman in particular as, as a good example of this is trust is the incorporation of a particular type of risk. And it's the risk that you don't know if someone on the other side of the bargain is gonna live up to what they say they will. 
And for us, actually, when we're trying to understand how cyber criminals work together, it's really the concept, the related concept of trustworthiness that I think matters more. It's assessing, uh, you know, whether someone is likely to be a risk and can that risk be reduced in terms of understanding more about these people. And so in that case, I again went back to existing literature and there's a lot of very good work in the social sciences already in terms of theory and other areas looking at this. And uh, I identified certain elements of trustworthiness that I wanted to look at in the cybercrime sphere. So these are things very familiar to us in life and very familiar to us in terms of the existing literature on, on cooperation. So one is uh, reputation. The second one is performance, which is basically demonstrating certain qualities or certain characteristics. And the final one is appearance, which in cyber is, is very interesting because unlike offline appearances, online appearances can be changed quite easily. They can be changed in terms of the persona that you create when you go online or when you're in a particular community, far easier than we can change aspects of our physical appearance, like our height or things like this are very difficult to change. And then the final component of this was really outside of the trust discussion um, and it was really the, the topic of enforcement. And again, this is a widely discussed topic within, within broader literature, uh, looking at, well, you don't necessarily need to have a trusting relationship with a person you're working with if there's come some kind of system in place, some kind of enforcement mechanism there that's going to mean that you can, in a sense, feel comfortable doing business with this person if you know that that's going to be enforced in some other kind of way. So that's the background to this. So I'll walk you through them one by one in terms of what I found in, in this cybercrime case. So repeated interaction um, is, a, is a huge part of the literature and cooperation. The more we deal with people, the more we learn about them, the more we feel comfortable working with them uh, further, or we decide that we want to cease working with them because we, we've discovered that they're not trustworthy. And this is something in cybercrime that's very, very important. And in the online setting, uh, really, really key. And the cyber criminals that I interviewed, uh, this was one of the, the most important things to them, is that once they found someone who they'd worked with and had gone well, they wanted to continue working with them as long as they could. They wanted to continue that cooperation, that collaboration as far in, into the future as they could. And they would only stop when the person disappeared or they were arrested, or eventually perhaps they did get ripped off. And that was really a, a key thing. The problem with cybercrime is that you get this paradox around how reputation actually functions in online environments, because you have people using online nicknames as their primary way of identifying themselves. And the challenge here is that these nicknames can be changed very easily. So what happens is if you're trying to build up a good reputation, you want to hold the same nickname. You want to use the same nickname for as long as possible because that builds up a brand that you're a safe person to work with, you have a good product and so on. But if you're worried about past actions where maybe you've ripped people off and there's going to be other criminals who are annoyed with you, or you're worried about law enforcement tracking you down, you want to change your name as regularly as possible. But you can't do these two things at the same time. You can't hold the same name and change it all the time. And so this creates a paradox for cyber criminals. There's actually no perfect equilibrium. And so what I found in terms of the research that I did was that they really, it becomes a personal preference. Uh, some people very uh, tied to holding a name, others less so. And then depending on what role they play within the industry, whether they're someone whose whole brand is built around selling a product or whether they're someone like a high level malware coder who they provide a very, very niche skill and they don't work with many people. So in those cases, it's safe to change their name very regularly and they can just sort of clue in a small number of people when they need to. So that's a very important part of this. In terms of reputation more broadly, it's not enough that you can just you know, learn about someone by working with them. You need information often on other people you haven't worked with before because you need to decide whether to work with them in the first instance or to expand your network or, or, or gain new contacts. And so this works very similarly in cybercrime as it does in, in other aspects of human life. So information moves between social networks. They have referrals. It's very common to vouch for people and say, I've worked with this person. You can trust them. They also do background checks on each other in terms of drawing up all the kind of electronic footprint, all the information that's available online on these forums and marketplaces and elsewhere, trying to draw a picture of, of what's the background of this person. And the final part of this is, is the role that marketplaces play. And they play a very important role, I think, in terms of institutionalizing reputation and scaling it up. Because what they're really doing is publishing information on reputation. And they do this by having qualitative reviews that people can leave online that are publicly available, or by having quantitative rating systems. So if you've done business with someone before, very much like eBay or some other platforms, you give someone a rating and then that appears on their profile. And so ultimately, this lowers the cost of doing business. Instead of having to check out you know, potentially thousands of people, you have some initial at least information on reputation that you can use um, going forward. And so that's very valuable, I think. The second component of trustworthiness is, is this idea of performance. Uh, in the case of cyber criminals, this can be very general. They can do sort of tutorials in some of these communities showing people how to commit criminal acts or how to do sort of various technical endeavors, uh, basically sort of displaying to the community they have certain skills and they're worth potentially doing business with. 
but it becomes more specialized in some sense when they begin trying to work together. Uh, they might have various tests in place, like asking for samples of a product or telling someone to do a small job before they engage in, in a much larger job. This is very normal. This is what we'd expect, I think, in, in broader aspects of life. And we see this within cybercrime. But going to the forums and the marketplaces, again, these, these locations like Carter Planet and, and, and many others, um, they've also institutionalized this performance mechanism. What they've done is created a label that they call verified vendor or reviewed vendor, where basically people within the marketplace are assigned to review the product of someone who wants to sell. They then write a report. And if it all checks out, they stamp this person with this verified vendor label. And this is then a signal to the community that this person has been checked out. So again, it's lowering the cost of, of having to check every single time someone you want to do business with. So the final part of, uh, of this trustworthiness discussion is, is appearance, as I mentioned. This was a very funny one when I interviewed some of the former cyber criminals because it seemed very important to them, but they struggled to explain exactly how it worked. So they'd say things like, well, I can interpret things very easily. I can interpret people's behavior. I can try and learn something about their true self based on what they're projecting online. But they'd also say things like, well, don't act like a law enforcement agent. And it was unclear what that meant exactly, but I'll, I'll explain with a, with a case study shortly how that kind of plays out. To me, some of the key elements around appearance are actually things that are very difficult to change. They're very difficult to fake, even in an online environment. One of those is language and also cultural knowledge around nationality. So if you're pretending to be a Russian language speaker, uh, that's very difficult to fake, particularly if you're pretending to be a native speaker or fluent speaker. Google Translate is not going to work for you. And that, that's in the, in the reverse direction as well. If you're pretending to speak English and you're a Russian speaker, that's not going to work well for you either. So this is actually something that you need to spend a lot of time earning, earning the language ability or at least being born with it. Um, so you can't fake that so easily. And so that's actually a restriction that I think matters a lot in terms of people deciding who to do business with. And this matters because there's suspicion between different groups as to who's more likely to be law enforcement. It matters in terms of Russian speaking cyber criminals being viewed as higher level and maybe more capable. So you might actually want to work with one. So in some sense, speaking broken English in one case of a cyber criminal I interviewed said this was very important. They wanted to talk to people uh, who didn't speak English perfectly because they thought it was more likely they were, they were a higher quality cyber criminal, which is somewhat ironic, I think. And the final part about this in terms of appearance is the amount of time that you spend online is, is very important uh, because this is a signal of how much you've invested within your profile. And if you're then going to burn that profile, if you're going to rip people off and throw away that reputation, that, that's a cost to you. So the more time you spend online, I think for appearance, and that often appears in your profile in various ways, or at least your kind of general awareness within the community, that matters, I think, for, for your appearance and how trustworthy you're likely to seem. So the final aspect of this in terms of cooperation, as I mentioned, is outside of the, the direct trustworthiness discussion uh, is around enforcement. And this is often tied to you know, flow of information being very effective or institutions. And, and I've been talking about that in relation to some of the other elements in terms of how these marketplaces institutionalize and scale up some of these aspects of cooperation. What we see in cybercrime is actually things that are, again, quite familiar to us. Uh, from other aspects of human life. So we see a lot of the theory playing out in reality. So we see on a very small level, um, if you get ripped off or you want to enforce uh, yourself, so kind of self-enforcement, you can just cease cooperating with people as a form of punishment. You can attack them. So dis distributed denial of service attack is one way of, of attacking other criminals online. It's basically kind of knocking out their computer or their system. Another one is doxing, which is drawing up all the information you can find on someone's true identity and then publishing it. Now, this is very embarrassing potentially for a cyber criminal if anonymity is really important to them. Uh, it's also potentially very dangerous because it means that uh, law enforcement might be coming after them very shortly. The other component of this is swatting, which is effectively calling police and saying that there's a violent situation going on in someone's house. You basically send an armed tactical police unit to someone's house and they think there's potentially a siege or something going on can be really, really potentially dangerous. So these are ways that they can punish each other if they choose to do it on an individual scale. The other two components, uh, one is exclusion, which is basically banning people from different groups or different marketplaces or forums. This is a kind of social death. You're effectively killing the reputation tied to a nickname. So if people want to come back, they've got to build the reputation again. So it's not like real death, but it has a cost associated there. And the last one is escrow and arbitration services. And I think this one's very interesting because of how similar it is to what we see in other aspects of human life. So cyber criminals are just like us in terms of if they're going to do a large transaction, they often want to have a third party who's going to hold the, the funds or potentially the goods as well, check everything out and then 
basically guarantee the deal. And so they do the same thing. And they also have arbitration services, which look a lot like court cases in an informal sense. Um, there might be a dispute. Someone is placed in charge of arbitrating that. They'll call for evidence. They'll call for chat logs or other types of information. And then they'll make a decision, which could lead to banning or some other type of punishment, depending. So again, it's, it's very familiar to us and, and, and quite interesting how similar these cyber criminals are to, to other aspects of, of human life. So I'm going to try and tie this up together very quickly uh, with, with a short case study. Uh, if you don't know this image, this is a cartoon character from the 1980s as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is Master Splinter, who was the rat sensei in that cartoon. Uh, in cybercrime, Master Splinter was the online nickname of a very important cyber criminal in the mid 2000s. So he was a very famous Polish spammer. His offline name was Pavel Kaminsky. And uh, he rose through the ranks of one of the most important cyber criminal marketplaces at the time, which was called Dark Market. And he became an administrator, which was the top rank uh, in you know, a forum that has potentially thousands of members. The only problem was that uh, Master Splinter was not in fact Pavel Kaminsky. He was this undercover FBI agent based in Pittsburgh called Keith Malarski. And he basically infiltrated this network and got to the very top of it. And that's uh, a very interesting case to study in terms of how he managed to navigate these elements of trust and cooperation to, to get that far into this network. So I'm gonna talk you through a little bit about how he did that. So for one, he tried to learn about the kind of language and the style of talking. So if you looked at the, the name Master Splinter, he actually changed some of the letters around. He made it a little more kind of hackerish, uh, trying to fit into the, the culture really in some sense. But more important than that, I think what was key to his success was he managed to forge a reputation as a really elite cyber criminal. And he did this by collaborating with an NGO called Spam House. Spam House tracks spam all over the world, and they're very famous for producing a top 10 list of the worst spammers in the world. And so what Malarski managed to do was to get Master Splinter, aka Pavel Kaminsky, onto this top 10 list. And this became a very, very strong signal to cyber criminals that this was a high level cyber criminal, and therefore someone that they should respect. And the, the kind of follow on from this that's really interesting in this case was I think Malarski was able to use that reputation to avoid committing criminal acts, to avoid kind of breaching his rules of engagement as an undercover agent, and to keep some of these unsavory elements away from him. So what he could do was basically, if someone asked him to do some sort of criminal business, say, well, I'm a really big deal, and you're not, you're a small fish, and I don't have time to waste on you. And so this was, I think, key to him maintaining his cover and keeping out of trouble. It also shows you that cyber criminals read the same information that people in, in the white sphere are reading, that people who are in a legitimate industry or law enforcement are also reading. So that's quite interesting how this information moves between these two worlds. So the final part about this is he didn't act like a law enforcement agent. And I was mentioning this earlier, but the key component of this case where that's relevant is that Dark Market was at war with another marketplace at this time, which kept attacking it. And at one point, the head of that marketplace tracked down Malarski's true identity, tracked it down to an office in, in Pittsburgh, which he believed was a government office. And so he basically suggested to the Dark Market people that they had an undercover agent within their marketplace. And so at this point, they went to Malarski and they questioned him on this, and he reacted very aggressively, basically denying this. And also at this point, he controlled the forum. He'd actually taken the marketplace dark market onto an FBI server because he'd been asked to protect it. So Pavel Kaminsky, this, this cover, had been asked to protect the site from the attack because he is supposedly very good at things like this. And so at this point, having control of the marketplace, he basically said to the group, if you don't trust me, take this back. I don't want control of this marketplace. Take the server, you be in charge of this, and I'll just leave. And the cyber criminals in this case really thought of this as a very strong signal that this was not an undercover agent because no law enforcement agent would give the evidence back. So he wasn't acting like a law enforcement agent. Of course, there was a miscalculation there in terms of how digital evidence works that you know multiple copies, but this to them was a strong signal, I think shows how some of these elements work. So after this case, there was a lot of fear. There's a lot of arrests that happened. There was market takedowns and it led in my view to a retraction amongst some of the more elite cyber criminals into smaller groupings that they thought they wanted to only work with a smaller number of people they'd known for longer and they trusted. And that was really putting an even greater kind of uh, emphasis on trust and on reputation on all these sorts of questions. Some of them, and this is a part that doesn't get discussed a lot within cybercrime, 
retracted offline. So they actually want to just work with people they know in an offline setting. So they're trying to solve the puzzle a little bit by cheating, by not working with anonymous criminals, just working with criminals. And we see this actually with some groups that never go online at all in terms of their cooperation to a large degree. So we see this with various fraudsters around the world, whether they're uh, you know, some well-known groups within Romania that do online auction fraud or well-known groups in Nigeria that do email scams or other types of things. A lot of these people actually know each other in person and their solution to the trust problem and the cooperation problem is actually to avoid the most complex part, which is to avoid dealing with strangers and actually do this in a more traditional and traditional criminal sense. So that's an important point that I'll just touch on at the end here. In terms of conclusions, uh, my main takeaway on this point is, as I mentioned, a lot of people view cyber as a sort of brand new, sometimes magical type of topic. Uh, but actually, in my view, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. These are people. And so we should study them as people. And, and the first thing is really to test whether existing knowledge that we have about how humans function in different ways can be applied to cyber criminals. And in the case of cooperation and trust, I think that's uh, very applicable. And I think a lot of the theory that already existed applies to these cases. The setting's a little bit different. We have to understand how it works in that, in that way. And I think the, the question of anonymity is an interesting one. And I think that changes certain dynamics, but it doesn't challenge the, the core theory itself. All it does is challenge how, how the application works in some sense. But that's, that's a point where I think further thought needs to be given exactly how anonymity works or doesn't work. And the final point I'll make here is, is basically, in a sense, what this looks like in this world and in terms of cooperation between the different elements within the criminal world, but then potentially with law enforcement as well, is there's kind of an informal uh, game going on between law enforcement and the, and the criminal world in this space, which is when the criminals cooperate very successfully and they become very effective, they almost overreach. And this happened in Carter Planet and some of these earlier cases, they become too big, too visible, too much of a threat. And so they get taken down by law enforcement. And this forces them to retract it forces them to move into smaller groupings. But what we see then is it becomes harder for law enforcement to actually penetrate these groups and to do their job in terms of investigating them. And so the success of law enforcement actually leads to failure in some sense. And it kind of goes on and on like this. And so the ultimate takeaway is really, I think because cybercrime is quite a new thing, people view it as, well, we didn't have it before, so we have to try and get rid of it. But just like crime, we're never gonna get rid of it. It's gonna be a cycle that goes on and on. There's gonna be high points and low points. And it's really a question of how it's managed. Um, and some of these points around cooperation is what's the level of cooperation and success that we're willing to let the criminals get to before they're kind of trimmed back down. And that's really about where it's at is, is what's that level and how do we best get there? So on that note, I'm going to, uh, to leave my presentation there and say, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan, uh, for this um, very interesting talk and uh, your insights about an unusual but but really fascinating case um, and your sociological uh, view on that, um, that cyber criminals are people too. Um, very fascinating. Um, and um, yeah, uh, Carolina, um, you are the discussant and you uh, have the chance to comment on, on Jonathan's talk. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Jonathan. Um, I finally got hold of the book, and it was a, a real pleasure to read, like really uh, fascinating. Um, I must say that I'm a layperson in this type of uh, uh, topic. I mean, I, I work around cybersecurity governance, but I'm certainly not a specialist in cybercrime. Uh, but coming from, from a social science background, I really uh, enjoyed it reading this so much. I mean, the, the ethnographical dimension that you bring in, the stories um, and, and the work. I mean, and, and I'm just going to start saying that I really, um, I really appreciate your, your, uh, the appendixes of the book. <laughs> uh, for any researcher, I mean, getting to really grapple with how you manage to address uh, such a um, contentious and uh, undercover topic um, is, is really a luxury. I mean, and it's, it's, um, it's really uh, illuminating to, to read your, those pages there where you really um, address how you manage to uh, come about in a very uh, original research. Um, just framing a little bit the topic uh, for um, the participants here who are attending this lecture. Um, and that's the book and, and Jonathan uh, have developed already. I mean, there's, um, there's um, cybercrime is 
part of the of a larger debate around cybersecurity, but cybersecurity has this problem of being all, also a very loosely uh, defined uh, area. And uh, but basically, we all understand. I mean, and particularly within the current context of COVID nineteen, that uh, cybersecurity is a very uh, critical area uh, in the current uh, situation where we rely so much on digital technologies. But even before COVID, the COVID-19 crisis and the reliance on uh, digital technologies, this is a market that uh, is flourishing. It's one of the industries that uh, in the whole uh, cyber domain is really um, generating um, income, revenue, and wealth, uh, both for cyber criminals and for non-criminal activities. So um, the more this uh, global cybersecurity market grows and it's the uh, search engines and or the industry reports, I mean, they are full of different uh, predictions around how this market will grow in the next years. Uh, growing in, in five or six years time, triplicating uh, its, uh, its size in terms of uh, US dollars. This also, one would say, well, this is an incentive, might provide an incentive for cyber criminal activities and even more granular and specific uh, profiles of cyber criminals <laughs> addressing this uh, ever uh, increasing and expanding um, um, digital domain. So um, this is a, a provocation. I mean, as do, do, do we think, and uh, Jonathan, is, are, are, are these incentives growing regarding these uh, uh, for, for cyber criminal activities uh, in, in light of this expanding notion of, um, of the cyber domain and particularly uh, um, the cybersecurity and all the profit-driven activities? Um, well, as, as Jonathan already mentioned, I mean, the, the, um, and, and Frank as well, I mean, the, there are two critical arguments around this, this book, and, and, and it's that cybercrime has evolved into a sophisticated profit-driven industry, and uh, it seeks to understand how this evolution has taken place under the umbrella of anonymity, you know? and what are the challenges that cybercriminals uh, uh, might uh, might address in order to uh, operate and to choose to operate alone or in groups. Um, and and the, the, the work is um, elaborates on, on, on a very, um, on a genealogy as well of, on how uh, the, the concept of, uh, of a cyber criminal and of a hacker has evolved over time. I mean, although this is something that uh, the literature uh, has also also captured uh, in in this respect. I mean, there's a very uh, there's a very fine and um, uh, perspective on how uh, actually the the work around anonymity and this process of uh, cyber criminals deciding to to choose. Uh, uh, working alone or with others, and and how to address this tension that um, that Jonathan was developing, and which there's a whole chapter of, around it, around the concept of identity um, and and nicknames, and and how to to work with uh, building one's own reputation, but uh, understanding the risks that are, are hidden uh, there. Um, this is, I mean, part of the the whole uh, narrative and and uh, of of the, um, vertebral uh, argument of, of the of the work um, now I mean I have I have some questions I mean just to uh, address a more um, to address or, or, or let's say promote a discussion uh, in in this lecture and um, and this uh, and this is something that uh, in the cyber uh, governance domain more generally and not even cybersecurity, but we are always um, addressing the issues of, and, and you do so with the metaphor of old old wine in new bottles or new bottles in new wine, <laughs> and, and, and the options around there. So um, in which way can these criminal activities actually uh, reshape um, the um, how we talk about uh, cooperation uh, and governance uh, around the, the digital and, and more broadly about global governance. I mean, as 
we rely more and more on, on these. In, in which way are these uh, activities and in shaping this, uh, this, these issues? Or uh, you suggest many times that the analog world, I mean, and the traditional criminal activities or the traditional corrupt agents in governments, I mean, they, they are not doing something different than what they would do uh, in in uh, in other circumstances, I mean, in in the the the, the digital uh, extrapolates to the analog and the analog to the digital, and there's this uh, this fluidity, and and we can use uh, our traditional conceptual uh, and theoretical tools from um, from go the governance literature and cooperation literature and and trust, and um, uh, in order to um, address some of the challenges that uh, cybercrime is uh, proposing. No? So um, this is something I think that uh, uh, is, is a very uh, relevant discussion uh, that you address uh, in, in your book and in the previous conversation we had as well uh, a, a few days ago uh, when planning this lecture and I think there's a, a lot to be um, addressed in that respect. Um, I. I think I'm running out of time, but th there is another issue um, I would like to um, to bring forward in the discussion. And again, it's bringing a, a general uh, tension uh, that has been existing in the cyber domain for many years, uh, but with which lately we have seen many uh, demands and pressures from networks of civil society groups and governments um, due to government actions. Uh, in the United States, in Europe, in some countries in Latin America in particular, that as far as I know, regarding um, the um, um, advancement of encryption tools and how governments are stopping this. And giving, uh, the, given the knowledge you have uh, around uh, uh, cyber criminals and, and cyber crime more fully, I mean, how, and, and the issue of anonymity and, and, and the, um, the tension that, uh, <laughs> the uh, free speech defenders uh, have with regards to anonymity as well to protect free speech. So um, uh, I want to inscribe this debate of anonymity in this broader landscape around uh, this issue, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more around that, Jonathan. And so I've run out of time, but uh, anyway, mm, I have a few other comments, but we can chat later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for this great comment. And uh, maybe you can add uh, some comments later um, in our discussion. Um, I think, Jonathan, um, you have the chance to briefly respond uh, to Carolina's comment, and then we go to the to the public uh, discussion. Yeah, very. very uh, thank you very much. They're very interesting comments. Um, I think, as you mentioned, the, one of the key elements here is, is what's new here, I guess, or what is cybercrime offering that, that's different from what's come before. And, and a lot of the time, I'm, I think, pu pushing back against people who want to present something that's you know, hugely new, um, that everything's new. We kind of throw everything out and just start again. And I think I tried to show that in the presentation and the book in terms of, no, I think we need to kind of acknowledge that the this is part of the broader social sciences um, that these are people and, and try and build up knowledge from there. And so I think, but you don't want to go too far in terms of ignoring what's actually new and interesting um, and just say, this is exactly the same as everything else. So there are certain points, I think, as you picked out that kind of analog digital divide, or you might call the online and the offline divide, that's really a key part of this. And it's a part of this, not just in terms of uh, the offenders involved, it's a part of it in terms of the victims and, and others as well, in terms of, you know, if we talk about COVID, how much has gone online recently, um, in terms of our day to day life, in terms of all the transactions that we're doing online that we might have done in person before, uh, this changes the dynamics quite significantly, uh, in terms of probably increasing the opportunity further for criminals, um, reducing some of the risks, but actually one of the points that's been forgotten is that even in this weird time, there are probably some limitations on criminal activity as well. Uh, some of them, you know, used to what's called cashing out, which is basically converting some of the the, the the virtual gains into physical or monetary ones often involves going to ATMs or going to shops and buying things with credit cards that are compromised and various things like this. Uh, if you have a lockdown situation, it's suddenly very noticeable <laughs> if you're doing large numbers of transactions. So this kind of dynamic is, is really interesting. And I think that's going to keep changing. I think the narrative that cybercrime is only going to grow 
um, is true more on the on the side of how much we continue putting online. But we might re reach a plateau in terms of we reach a point at which this is how humans work now with all these technologies. There's going to be changes as new ones emerge. But ultimately, I think I want to avoid the kind of mass fear, uh, but still acknowledge there is obviously a, a much broader change in how humans are working, interacting, doing business, all sorts of things. And we're right in the middle of this now. Even this, this event is, is an example of this. Um, and so that's going to change some, some dynamics. And we need to kind of keep balancing what, what is the old with what is the new and, and have a sober assessment. So that would be my kind of a, a overview answer to that. The encryption point, we can get into the politically uh, <laughs> complex stuff. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll take like that like this, which is, um, again, it, it's an example where I think we're trying to see something very complex uh, in some of the discussions that we have. Uh, and there's aspects of encryption that are complex. I mean, if you're getting to the te technical aspects of it, you know, there's people who specialize in this that are very, very capable, technical, you know, intelligent people. Uh, but the social component of it, what I mean by that, how the average person engages with encryption is not that complicated. So. A lot of chat services now, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's others, these are encrypted. And so the average person uh, is and can use encrypted communications very simply. So when we have this discussion, whether it's about criminals, whether it's about terrorists, whether it's about others, uh, we're not really talking about something that's that's highly complex. It can be. There are certain people that might engage with other types of encryption. Um, but we're talking about things that are, that are widely available um, and that have a very positive use in, in many aspects of life. I mean, if you think about research, you often encrypt data that's sensitive because you're protecting participants in some way. And so there's there's a really, again, it goes, it's the same as hacking, it's the same as a whole bunch of things. It, there's a sense of motivation behind it um, as to whether it's used for positive or negative purposes. And then that becomes a much broader question in terms of public policy as to what is it primarily being used for? So if you have um, some type of uh, system that's you know almost exclusively used for criminal activity and has very little social gain, you might think about legislating against that in a certain way. But if you have something else that's widely used and is of huge value to a large number of people and a very small criminal component, um, that, that, that has a different calculation. So maybe I won't provide a direct, direct on answer there because actually I find this whole issue very complex and confusing myself. Um, but I think that, that that's my kind of encryption response is it's not as complex as we think it is. And, and so therefore it's, it's much itself more embedded in day-to-day -day life. And, and as a result, more embedded in criminal life, even for those who are not particularly technical criminals. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, many questions from the audience, uh, which is always a good uh, sign for, for an interesting talk. Um, I think I, I will read uh, them and collect them. Maybe uh, you can collect three questions and then Jonathan, you can respond. Yeah, um, good. yeah. Uh, the first question is from Jan Art Scholte, um, one of our co-directors at the center. Um, he asked, the basis of trust mentioned, reputation, performance, appearance, relate very much to the specific individual and direct interpersonal relations. I wonder whether other sources of trust known from legal cooperation might also be relevant in criminal cooperation. For example, political values, shared ideology, collective identification, shared nationality, faith, ethnicity, etc. Levels of general social trust and so on. A second question is from Peter Müller. He writes, hello, I'm working as a financial crime analyst and I would like to ask what importance the author would give Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for the cybercrime community. Mm -hmm. And the second question is from Katja Freistein from the center. I'm wondering about the more private aspects of these criminal cooperation endeavors. Do these cyber criminals who need to remain anonymous also use cooperation as coping mechanisms, for example, because they can't break? And do personal friendships develop? So that these are uh, three questions and we have more of them. Um, yeah, not so much time to left. Yeah. But maybe you can, um, yeah, uh, respond. I'll, I'll do uh, my best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so the first one in terms of broader aspects of cooperation. So I think you're absolutely right. I focused on on really aspects of the economics and kind of how the business worked, which was partly um, these individual components of cooperation. 
Uh, and then also broad, more broader than that, kind of like institutional components in terms of um, systems of order, regulation, these kind of things. Uh, but you're, you're right that there are other components here. And I did find suggestions of that in, in, in different respects. So, I mean, you talk about ideology or values. There certainly is within different cyber criminal communities aspects are kind of like you start to see a culture and there'll be different cultures depending on the communities involved in terms of what their interests are, um, political views. And there's a strong national uh, element to this. So I mentioned before that there, there's kind of a division. There's a really strong division between the Russian speaking cyber criminal world and the English speaking cyber criminal world. And by English speaking, that includes cyber criminals from all over the world. Um, that just becomes the kind of language of exchange. Um, you will find communities in a whole range of different languages and countries that, you know, smaller communities based around specific languages um, all over the world. But the English and the Russian are the two main spheres. And there's, there's a definitely a tension between the two uh, and a suspicion, uh, particularly on the, on the, the side of uh, a lot of the, the Russian speaking cyber criminals are quite cautious when dealing with English speakers, partly because there's a greater chance they might be undercover agents, also partly because there's a greater chance they think they, they may be less competent. Uh, this is something I encountered in my interviews. They thought, well, th they don't know what they're doing, whereas your people in our community do. That ties into that then some politics. Um, we saw, you know, with the war in Ukraine, um, actually some disputes emerging between different cyber criminals in the Russian speaking scene. So prior to that, there was a sense of brotherhood amongst those from the former Soviet states, work together, don't attack at home. And by home, that meant Russian speaking countries um, only attack the West and some other locations in terms of where the victims are. But what we saw, uh, you see with some of these um, sort of political issues uh, that can sometimes spill over. And so you saw what's known as flame wars between some probably Ukrainian and Russian cyber criminals who sort of identify themselves as such, then getting into fights with each other, um, getting into disputes. And there was some suggestion in certain marketplaces that this needed to be tamped down. They needed to stop this kind of political discussion. They need to stop discussion of ideology and all these sorts of things. So that becomes an element um, that, that is potentially very relevant, I think, both in terms of potentially uh, providing sources of, of broader cooperation, but then also breaking up cooperation in certain points when, when they reach dispute. Um, the second question on, on cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, uh, so widely used by cyber criminals, um, but widely used in my view, there's probably some that are interested in the underlying technology, but for a lot of them, the key point is actually around anonymity. Um, they're looking for payment systems where they don't have to use their real identity. Uh, so prior to Bitcoin existing and, and some of these other cryptocurrencies existing, there were actually other virtual currencies uh, that came into uh, existence quite early. Um, so perfect money was one, web money, Liberty Reserve was a really, really big one uh, for a while. And these offered the same value as Bitcoin or some of these other cryptocurrencies. They weren't cryptocurrencies, but what they were was virtual currencies where you didn't have to use your real identity. And that's what they want. They want something that is something they can hide from without their real identity and also the transaction can't be reversed. Um, they're always trying to avoid reversible transactions. And so these particular virtual currencies were hosted in either Russia or Costa Rica and some of the locations where certain law enforcement agencies were struggling to reverse these transactions and get to them. Eventually Liberty Reserve in his example was it was shut down by US Secret Service operation and they managed to, to arrest and extradite the individuals behind that. So um, the main point there is it's the virtual part of the currency that matters so they can trade online and it's the ability to hide their identity and not um, have reversible transactions rather than the crypto part that I think matters. Although there will be some individuals interested in that component particularly. And then the part, the last one, I'm just trying to remember exactly uh, about the private and the, whether there's personal friendships that, that develop. Um, yeah. So yes, um, they do. And actually that case I was telling you about with that undercover agent, Keith Malarski, um, there were people who didn't believe that he was an undercover agent even after the case was out in the public, even after people had been arrested, because they'd known him online for so long and they had long conversations with him, they actually, I think, felt that they were friends with him and didn't believe that he was this undercover agent. Um, so certainly a number of the former cyber criminals I spoke to had um, developed, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of business involved. But I think when you deal with someone for long enough, sometimes that bleeds into a broader relationship. Often, and it's how the trust and the cooperation works as well. The longer they know each other, they feel more comfortable. Maybe they start to speak on the phone or various things. They're starting to give away gradually more aspects of their identity. And in certain cases, as I was mentioning, and this kind of offline part, 
I know of cases where people have met online and eventually decided to meet up in person, sometimes for social reasons, actually, more than anything. And there's a strong blend between the business and the social when they decide that they're going to have an offline relationship. And some, some of the cases I was talking about, um, that early network, the Carter Planner Network, some of the people involved in that um, really had a number of gatherings. There was a couple of conferences held that were like business conferences, but strong social element. And then some smaller gatherings where people really gathered to, to socialize, to party, um, go a little bit wild, but also to do business, to learn stuff, to set up new schemes. And so there's a kind of strong mix between the two, but absolutely they, they do. There, there's some people who, who dislike kind of getting to know others, but there's certainly a number that do make friends, I think over time. Okay, thank you very much. We have three more questions and I think uh, we already need to close uh, the list then. Um, yeah, the questions are not very brief. Um, the first one is uh, yeah, from Victoria Derrien. Thank you very much for this in very interesting presentation. I'm interested in what you mentioned as a requisite for maintaining its reputation online and the successful example of this FBI agent Uh, Mr. Splinter, who managed to infiltrate groups. However, it appears that states, authorities, and legislation struggle to keep up with hackers, a problem that seems to be appearing in other criminal activities, such as drug production, for example. How could states better tackle that issue, and could a strength cooperation between states help combating cyber criminality? A second question is from Zoma Basu. How do cyber criminals forge political associations? If a cyber criminal is associated with, an, with any political party, for example, troll troops, does, does that affect or have any implications on trust and cooperation among his peers with different political uh, inclination? And the third one is from Sigrid Quack, our director. Um, it's a, it's a It's a double question. The first part, um, you spoke about cybercrime often being centered in specific places, locations. Has there been a globalization of cybercrime over time as compared, for example, to the internationalization of Italian mafia clans? Are there examples of federated networks where only small groups know each other and are linked to specific individuals or to other subgroups? And the second part of the question, Would network structure be a supportive element for cybercrime beyond the trust mechanism, which you highlighted, particular when cybercrime networks are active on a global scale? Or is that a misconception? Are, are they not that global international in the end in terms of their composition? Very good questions. And uh, yeah, we have a final round. And uh, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. So uh, the first question I think was uh, really looking at this being a kind of growing issue. How do we deal with it? Uh, and what can states do in terms of cooperation? Uh, this was a topic that not every law enforcement agent that I interviewed, but many, many law enforcement agents that I interviewed was a common complaint about the, the lack of effective cooperation um, between different law enforcement agencies in different countries. Actually, sometimes between different law enforcement agencies in the same country. Um, The main issues really get down to how internationalized aspects of cybercrime are. Um, this could be offenders in different locations from each other. It could be offenders and victims in different locations, or it could just be the way that they're attacking, committing the crime involves infrastructure that's hosted in a range of different countries. And as soon as you get that transnational element, it causes huge problems for an investigation uh, because they need approvals to do a whole range of things. And so one of the big issues there Uh, we have this kind of high level discussion, you know, do we need more in terms of cybercrime treaty and all these kinds of questions, uh, of which there are certain elements of this already. Um, but a lot of this is actually lower level types of cooperation. We're talking about um, you know, individuals in, in particular cases, investigating cases uh, who need assistance very quickly. And so some of that doesn't necessarily have to be part of a really, really long 
uh, legal process, international legal process in terms of treaties and these types of things. I think a lot could be done in terms of just building social networks between investigators in different countries, uh, making sure that they're getting to know each other, maybe exchange programs, these kinds of things, liaison offices, um, because I think when it comes down to it, a lot can be achieved through uh, these types of interactions where people can provide assistance because they personally know that the individual is asking for assistance in a different country and maybe they can expect, expedite some of these things because otherwise things get very, very quickly uh, caught and certain cases really don't go anywhere for, for this reason. And it's really one of the main advantages of, of cybercrime uh, compared to some others is, is how difficult that transnational component makes it. So there's no easy answer. It's, it's a common complaint, um, but I think there probably, there are steps that could be taken, but I wouldn't just look at the high level. I'd look at some of the lower levels as well in terms of what could be done around law enforcement cooperation. Uh, the question around political associations, um, I'm just trying to... So it's a question around if people have different political views, whether that yeah. affects their ability to work together. So I think that might tie back to, to what I was talking about in terms of this Ukraine-Russia type of example, um, that it, it absolutely can, I think, if, if people reveal their, their true views on something, it can stop business. Um, some people prefer not to talk about things outside of the business and not get involved in that. But it's like, I think, any type of human interaction. If you, you do business with someone, you work with someone, suddenly if they start saying things that you don't agree with, that may lead to to um, you, you're not liking them particularly anymore and, and maybe harming the relationship. So as I go back to the point, they're people too, so they're gonna react in the same way. Some people might just think, well, it's business, I don't care. Um, or you know, even things like they're involved in aspects of cybercrime that I think are dangerous or I don't agree with, so I don't wanna work with them. So that, that's a personal choice and some may make that choice. Um, and the final point on hubs, I think it's really interesting one and, and one that uh, I think is one of the main points that I thought was significant coming out of the study that I did and, and quite surprised me in some sense was how localized some of this was. Coming into this, I thought, okay, this just exists online. It's just a very hard to pin down where, where things are happening and it's happening in, in the kind of online space. Uh, and in reality, what I found was a lot of these fender, offenders are grouped within specific locations. So you do very much see hubs um, you see places that are known for specific types of cyber crime. So I mentioned Romania is known for basically selling fictitious products online. So you, you see an ad, you buy it, but the product doesn't exist. Uh, Nigerian offenders have been known for these email scams or we're very familiar with. Uh, more recently, uh, what's known as business email compromise, which is basically tricking people who are in charge of accounts in organizations to pay into an account that they think is a legitimate one that's actually controlled by fraudsters. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about Russian cyber criminals are highly technical. That's what their kind of brand is in the business. And this comes out of the local environment. We're talking about people with a very strong technical background. Some of them have been through university and technical training, and there's not a great job market. And so what they end up doing is creating their own kind of criminal enterprises and, and being criminal entrepreneurs, cyber criminals entrepreneurs and, and cyber criminal programmers. So the hubs is really important. And so the globalization around that, uh, some of that's very localized, but what we have seen is certain networks spreading around the world coming out of some of these locations uh, because there remains, it seems anyway, a certain trust element between specific groups. If they come from the same place they, or they knew each other as they're growing up or went to school or university or whatever it might be, if they then move overseas, it suddenly becomes maybe a new hub there that they can work with the kind of headquarters back in their home country. So they're a trusted person now overseas. If they need to move money between different locations, sometimes a lot of these scams involve moving money from a victim in one country to another country. And so they need people in different points who can make those, those money transitions. And so often you'll see this with offenders, I've seen it in cases with some uh, Romanian offenders um, you know, in the UK and other locations that, that are providing that function. Um, and so that, that's absolutely the case. So we're seeing that kind of globalization, but it's not just like a rampant, like they're just gonna shoot anywhere and they're just gonna go anywhere. It's kind of like more tied to where particular individuals end up and they're sort of still within the network structure. Um, and I think that was the second part of the point, which is how important is the network structure, uh, hugely important. Um, and I think it's, it's both global and, and local in the sense that, um, as I said, you don't want to lose that that uh, that view of how how much this is rooted within specific people and specific contexts and environments. Uh, but at the same time, those people may move and they may become part of a more global network rather than just a kind of rampant spread. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are already a bit over time, but I think um, Carolina, as our discussant, should also have the opportunity to say. Uh, a final word, if you like. Um, 
Um, yeah, yeah. I, I would really like to keep up the conversation because um, I'm, so many of the last interventions, uh, in so many of the last interventions, the the whole Budapest thing comes to my mind and, and how there's this like very powerful treaty, but because it's not global, we have this this challenge and whether whether Budapest actually works or not uh, for for cyber criminal activities uh, from your perspective, because it's interesting if you talk to a law, uh, Leah, uh, law enforcement agent, uh, and I have done some work on in that respect in Latin America, and it doesn't work too much in Latin America because the criminals are coming from Russia and China, and Russia and China are not in Budapest. So um, <laughs> it's just a, an anecdote, but I mean, there, and there are many, many others, but yeah, to continue in a, another conversation, Jonathan. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, in particular to, to both of you, for Jonathan, for, for a fascinating talk, and uh, Carolina, for, for a great comment, and then in the very um, active audience. Um, I can only say again, um, if you need um, a Christmas gift for, for yourself or for a person who is interested in cooperation issues, um, yeah, buy the book uh, by Jonathan. And um, I think... It, it triggered me and I think also other people uh, to 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 look more at, at the dark sides of cooperation as I as I named it uh, before because it was not a major topic at our center but we should uh, it, it seems to me we should do, do more on that uh, in in that direction and um, yeah very interesting research and um, thank you again um, to all of you and good evening and yeah um, See you again um, in one of our events. Thank you. Okay.